I'm Faz Shakir. I'm Amanda Littman, and this is Battleground. Faz is still gone this week, spending time with his very cute new baby. Our guest this week on Battleground is Maurice Mitchell, who's the national director of the Working Families Party. Maurice Mitchell, welcome to Battleground. It's good to be here. <laughs> um, first, for those who may not be familiar with the Working Families Party, can you give us a short history? Sure. Okay. Short history. Um, well, well, the Working Families Party started in the late 90s. Um, and at the time, the Democratic Party had moved to a decidedly corporate sort of stance, the, you know, the whole triangulation of the Clinton White House. And many people in labor and in grassroots organizations and progressives and others felt like it was time to develop an independent political structure that could electorally uh, challenge what the Democrats were doing and pull them um, much closer to the left, but also be completely independent um, of their prerogatives. Since then, we've spread to a number of states. We have staff and operations in 20 states around the country. Ultimately, for us, a party is people, number one, that's like four ingredients, so people, <laughs> who come together to do electoral work, that's number two, in order to advance a an agenda, that's number three, and that agenda is woven together by um, a coherent ideology, number four. When that happens, you're a party. Whether or not you have ballot access or if legally and fiscally you filed with whoever, you're a party. And so that's how we understand our role in, um, in the country to be this national grassroots political movement of everyday people, of labor unions, grassroots organizations, um, activists, organizers who come together and believe that our government should be run by the people and not corporations and the very wealthy. The Working Families Party is understood to be building a multiracial working class movement. Can you define working class for the sake of how WFP thinks about it? Sure. So the, the way that we understand it is people who have to wake up every day, who have to put in work in order to survive. So that's a lot of people. Yeah. That isn't, that isn't <laughs> just necessarily like maybe how you might classically understand working class people as like industrial wage earners. Or, yeah, you know, it's not it's, like the economic term definition usually. Yeah, it's a pretty broad group of people. It's a lot of folks. But we think that distinction is, is really important because there's a small number of people who um, who just just by virtue of their wealth um, and their class position, um, when they when they come together and organize politically through different vehicles, they have very very different interests that we think collide with the interests of of everyday people who have to work in order to feed themselves and their families and and so those are those are the people that we we're attempting to organize. What's your story? What's your background? How did you get into community organizing? Both of my parents are immigrants from the Caribbean. They grew up in the rural Caribbean in um, in poverty. My, my grandmother was the first person to come here as a domestic worker. And it's the typical immigrant struggle. She brought some folks over. Everybody's living in one apartment. <laughs> Everybody's hustling. You know, more people come over. She had a lot of kids, around like 10 kids. And in that context, I definitely learned very quickly um, the things that still inform my politics. I was able to see the differences, how race, class, gender, immigration status, how they really impact people's lives. As a young person, I was a youth organizer. I went to Howard University. I spent a lot of time campus organizing at Howard University and a lot on criminal justice issues and, and, and police violence. And then with the death of uh, Michael Brown, with Trayvon's uh, murder, with those, with those looming very heavily on my soul and on my heart, that shifted the trajectory of my, my work. I and folks on the ground and folks around the country over years helped to build the movement for black lives and catalyze it to be an international movement. And Donald Trump got elected, which mm -hmm. was, a, I think, a crisis for any freedom-loving, <laughs> justice-loving <great>. person. <laughs> and um, I, I thought it was really necessary to take the experiences that I had from movement building, from grassroots organizing, from issue organizing, from electoral organizing, and apply it to creating um, at scale a movement that could challenge the white Christian identity movement that, that Donald Trump sort of was able to ride to the White House. One or two more sort of level setting questions here. New Yorkers are pretty familiar with Working Families Party. You know, we see it on our ballot. 
every election cycle. We see it in the news. It's always a big thing. Um, for people who are not New Yorkers and may not be for, as familiar with what WFP has accomplished, can you brag a little bit? For the past 20 plus years, the New York WFP has been finding opportunities to recruit people, like regular people, sometimes activists, um, sometimes organizers, um, but progressives to run and win against status quo candidates. Just to give you a, a sense of the arc, so Letitia James, people have heard of Letitia mm-hmm. James. Her first electoral campaign, right, was an independent WFP third party city council race. And now she is the attorney general of New York. And it, it was her independent investigation that led to this reckoning with Governor Cuomo, who was a now former Governor Cuomo. The WFP in New York. Um, had a long multi-year strategy of electing progressives in the New York City Council. And now the New York City Council has a, a, a huge number of progressives, right, that are able to caucus together. Do you believe that we can stay a two-party country? We live in a two-party state, a two, you know, very rigid two-party uh, government. Um, and, and also, on top of that, we're a country that also is the size of a continent, and there's more than 300 million people. And why I say that is that we have a lot of diversity in this country, right? A lot of regional, racial, and ideological diversity that makes it hard for two parties to be able to hold. And I think that means that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are rife for rupture. So within the Republican Party, we're seeing that right now, right? Where actual white nationalist and sort of um, conspiratorial Trumpist are the protagonists of the Republican Party, right? And there are institutional Republicans, right? But they are not the protagonists within their own party. Now, in the, in the Democratic Party, you know, and progressives and leftists and others have a hard time processing this, but we are, um, we are all in a united front often with Democrats. I lead a separate party. Um, Oftentimes, I join in a united front with Democrats. So it's almost like we are a multi-party sort of system and people who don't see themselves as Democrats join in. Like we, we endorsed Joe Biden. Joe Biden was not our pick. When I look at the future, I think a number of things might happen. I think it's possible that the Republican Party might collapse on the weight of its contradictions, right? Mm and um, turn into a regional versus a national phenomenon. That can only happen if um, we defeat their efforts to change the rules. They understand that they're at this existential crossroads. They're using political violence, the rigging of the rules, and then also trying to like diversify. They're doing all three things, right? (laughs) To kind of keep their thing together. I think that the Democratic Party is not impervious to rupture, right? I think as more and more independent progressives gain more and more power within the Democratic Party, it sets up a, a clearer ideological struggle between the corporate institutional interest and grassroots labor organizers. There will be, as the left side gains more power, that fight might happen and turn into rupture. If dialectically those conditions happen, we're building the structures in order to be that thing or part of that thing, that that political third force. My aspiration is that the WFP or the forces in and around the WFP can become a political third force in American politics. And we actually popularly think about Democrat, Republican, working families. Thanks for watching. You can get the full episode of Battleground on The Recount streaming daily or listen to it wherever you get your podcasts.